Good morning, everybody. This is a live severe weather briefing. This is going to be another Code Red severe weather briefing as we do expect tornado potential tomorrow across southern Louisiana, maybe as far west as far southeastern Texas <clears throat> as early as late afternoon into the early afternoon hours. And that threat is going to shift off to the east across southern Louisiana. That's why we're going to Code Red because this is a uh, imminent severe weather threat that's going to be happening tomorrow, and I'm activating uh, storm chase mode. Here you can see uh, the latest NAM model uh, solution, and this seems to have a good handle on this arc-shaped uh, band of uh, supercells that's going to surge across southern Louisiana, really impacting uh, that I-10 corridor out there. I am still planning on uh, chasing this. Uh, however, the surface flow does look to be a little bit weaker in these latest runs. I think that the shape uh, of this goose egg-shaped uh, close low as it ejects off to the northeast is a little bit different than some of the earlier model runs that were showing a deeper surface low across East Texas, even as low as about 994, 995 millibars. It looks like this thing's going to be in the extreme upper 990s, maybe even about 1,000 millibars, and kind of do a meandering motion off to the northwest, northeast, uh, instead of just barreling in to this stability axis that would lead to a more substantial severe weather threat still though i do expect a regional outbreak of tornadoes uh, potentially developing as early as late morning into early afternoon into far southeastern texas and then it becomes a mature line of broken supercells ripping off to the east very rapidly individual storm motions are going to be north northeast at about 50 miles an hour so you'll have land falling supercells coming in here same area that was hammered uh, by hurricane laura and uh, hurricane delta hurricane zeta was a bit further east as well four hurricanes here and uh, impacting southern Louisiana. And uh, these supercells are going to be coming ashore in the same area where Hurricane Laura and Hurricane Delta made landfall about 14 kilometers apart. Again, they could develop as early, even as early in the, near the Houston area uh, by late uh, tomorrow morning. You always get those early tornado warnings, even an early tornado report uh, down here in southeastern Texas before uh, the potential outbreak begins uh, in Louisiana downstream. Sometimes Louisiana has a tendency to completely bust in terms of these tornadoes, and that would be good news for southern Louisiana. But the threat is definitely there uh, for a potential regional outbreak of uh, severe weather. So this is uh, the surface low, at least according to the NAM, and we're going to break down many of these models and uh, assess the uh, differences uh, in the placement and the strength of that surface low. But really with a stronger surface low, if we were talking about a uh, surface low in the mid-990s, a little bit more compact, more of a surging surface low uh, that would uh, barrel in uh, to that instability axis, uh, bringing with it a stronger low-level jet, then I would think that the outbreak is almost a certainty. But there are some failure scenarios with this forecast. The models have been leading toward a slightly weaker surface low that almost does a meandering motion <clears throat> up toward the architects before finally ejecting toward the Great Lakes region. So really what could happen is a messy mode where you just get these bands of supercells, a squall line forms with embedded tornado warnings. We likely will meet that criteria for tornado outbreak, even if there's not those renegade supercells out ahead of the line. But many of the models are showing renegades across southern Louisiana into southwestern Mississippi uh, there at this setup. But definitely note the position of that surface low. This is at 21Z, uh, about uh, 3 p.m. Uh, Central Standard Time out here. Uh, right over, anchored over the eastern Texas Piney Woods uh, to the south of the I-20 corridor. And we're going to be tracking the position of that surface low in the different models. And uh, the dew points aren't going to be an issue across southern Louisiana. Upper 60s dew points coming in. Uh, a, a majority of the deeper instability, uh, the, the moderate and greater instability, remains largely offshore uh, over the open Gulf of Mexico waters. You could definitely see a... a moderation of those dew points in the marshlands right along the immediate shoreline but you do get mid to upper 60s dew points out here uh probably aided by some convergence also with that southerly low level jet pumping northward experiencing some convergence uh, right along the shoreline interacting with the land that low level flow definitely a little bit of decoupling happening there as well and uh, that's leading to uh, upper 60s dew points. Uh, Lake Charles, you've got a dew point of about 66 tomorrow at 3 p.m. according to the NAM. But really note this wraparound moisture that wraps all the way into the surface low. That's why late morning uh, toward uh, midday tomorrow, maybe early afternoon, uh, when this arc initially forms <clears throat> in East Texas all the way down to Houston, there is a chance of some early supercells and some tornadoes with this as it moves east across the uh, Texas Piney Woods 
uh, with the, the very packed low level flow streaming all the way in to that surface low with that easterly winds feeding into it. Uh, even though that <clears throat> surface low is about a thousand millibars there in the East Texas Piney Woods. And here's the effective warm front. Notice how it lifts a little bit further north in the Mississippi River Valley. Some funneling, uh, acceleration of that low level jet uh, through the Mississippi River Valley there. But really, uh, the greatest tornado threat could be a little bit out ahead of that squall line, uh, south central Louisiana, where you have the deeper moisture, some greater instability as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Here you can see the uh, low level jet accelerating according to the NAM above even 70 knots there according to the NAM. The HRRR is a 50 to 60 knot low level jet, a little bit weaker uh, with uh, less strong of a surface low up to an 850 low. Still, though, a very compact 850 low is being indicated by the new model runs. And really, you want to watch where this back edge ejects uh, earlier in the day, late morning, uh, toward the middle of the day. That axis is over <clears throat> southeastern Texas to the west of the Sabine River. And then it pushes off to the east along with that squall line with this big low-level jet out ahead of that squall line, creating quite a bit of wind shear. Uh, some of the models, the NAM with a stronger low-level jet, has that 0 to 1 kilometer storm relative helicity at around 300 meters squared per second squared. Some of the models have a little bit less low-level flow out here. The NAM has a, a little bit more marginal low-level shear, more unidirectional uh, on the order of about 200 meters squared per second squared. But we're going to break down these models right now, starting with the HRRR. And here is the HRRR shape of the 500 millibar low. This is actually a 0Z tomorrow. And notice how this thing has a lot of flow on the front side of it at the mid-levels of the atmosphere. This is at 500 millibars. A lot of that flow is also very meridional, which means largely south to north. You do get a little bit more of a westerly component uh, to the east of this Vortmax over Louisiana. That could be enough to encourage those north-northeasterly storm motions and uh, dramatically increase uh, the uh, low-level shear that's available to these storms. This is at 21Z, and look at how far south this thing is, uh, anchored uh, just to the west, uh, southern Texas hill country to the west of Austin there. But really, you'd like to see a little bit more symmetric flow, a little bit more, more flow on the backside. This tells me that this thing is no longer digging, but has already begun uh, the process by tomorrow afternoon of ejecting off to the northeast. Not a ton of vorticity of action downstream of a trough that's shaped like this. If you had more of an open wave, more of an egg-shaped uh, upper-level Vortmax with an effective uh, negative tilt northwest to southeast, then I think we'd have a bit more vorticity of action downstream of this thing. But it's a lot more of a circular upper-level Vortmax than was forecasted by the models yesterday and the day before. If you have an egg-shaped uh, closed upper low then you've got vorticity advection somewhere because it's not perfectly circular in this case there are some asymmetries also we've got a lot of flow uh, on the east side uh, of this system that's at 21z and let's track uh, the shape of this upper level vort but instead of that really nice northwest to southeast uh, tilt that negative tilt with this vort max and kind of an oblong shape uh, to the closed upper low that seemed to be more favorable for widespread severe weather over a larger area across Dixie Alley. Still, though, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, southern Louisiana, right along that I-10 corridor, Beaumont, Lake Charles, off to the east through Baton Rouge, definitely does have a potential for a tornado threat. Let's look at the surface low here, and this is at 21Z. The HRRR actually has a weaker surface low than last night's NAM and this morning's NAM, really just hovering there at about 1,000, 1,002 millibars just to the north of Houston. Notice though, the surface winds are still relatively backed uh, just to the east and to the northeast of that. Pseudo warm front uh, sets up to the north of the Houston area, even by late afternoon. And that's going to bring a tornado threat to the north of Houston there to begin this event. That meandering surface low, it's not a strong surface low like earlier runs of the European were showing. Diving down into about 994 millibars in East Texas with a, a stronger low-level jet, stronger low-level shear to the east of it. See how this surface low in the HRRR just kind of meanders northward through the Texas hill country during this period instead of just surging into the heart of Dixie Alley. That could be a uh, failure scenario for a more widespread tornado outbreak as this low just kind of meanders up toward the Arklatex. And this is at 3Z, so this is by 
uh, 9 p.m. Uh, Central Standard Time. We should have a line of storms well to the east of the surface low, kind of an arc shape. You can see a bit of a pseudo dry line uh, even to the south of the structure where those southwesterly winds back behind it, dew points dropping off dramatically on the south side of that surface low with those winds veering off the higher terrain, descending a bit. And then here is the uh, instability axis, and this is by 3Z, uh, eastern Louisiana out there. But this is 13Z tomorrow morning, about 8 in the morning tomorrow. See, a lot of the dew points are still uh, offshore. You do have some dew points that increase a bit into the mid-60s there in the Houston area, about 65 uh, down there uh, near Houston, Texas. So as we started starting to get toward late morning. And this is when there's a chance of supercells. A lot of times they like to develop just to the southwest of Houston out there. And uh, that low-level jet is uh, coming ashore by this time, late tomorrow morning. There it is. It's still yet to intensify. And with that weaker surface low, weaker 850 low, uh, more of a circular shape uh, to the upper level system and a reduced amount of positive vorticity of action downstream. We kind of have a more modest low level jet, but still about 40 knots out here. And along that warm front just in the north of Houston by late tomorrow morning, there are some soundings that are marginally favorable uh, for a tornado threat. Very mo moist profile all the way up. Quite a bit of turning as well uh, here in the low levels in the vicinity of that warm front. Uh, and uh, the, notice how the mid-level jet here is a bit more southerly, and that's bringing that storm motion a little bit closer to due south even early on. Still, though, with these uh, backed winds in the lowest uh, kilometer or two uh, over here in this quadrant of the hodograph, over here in this quadrant, uh, that's going to create enough wind shear. The area basically bounded by the hodograph curve and the storm motion vector is proportional to that storm relative low-level helicity there. And you do have a little bit of veer back veer in the levels above that. Some negative contribution to the helicity there. Decent shear between the four and six kilometer layer. But really the deep layer shear in a bulk sense is more important to evacuate the rain and the hail from the updraft to get a mesocyclone, uh, to get that vertical motion that can stretch any eddy, uh, for example, along the apex of the RFD, stretch it into the vertical to get a tornado threat. And uh, the storm motions are going to be a lot slower earlier on down there in the Houston area too, about 20 to 30 knots down there early. wonder if a couple of storm chasers will try to target the Houston area, southeastern Texas, to get on the board early uh, there by late morning, take a little bit of the pressure off during the chase. Then as we get a little closer to the midday uh, hour, this is at about 10 a.m., 11 a.m. here, you can see the low-level jet really funneling into the S Sabine Pass area there, uh, the border between Texas and Louisiana. Some of the worst bugs I've ever experienced in my life out here in the Sabine Pass area after we were chasing Hurricane Laura. Had an Airbnb down there right at the mouth, uh, right near the bridge over Sabine Pass. And man, we got lit up by just about every single kind of bug, deer flies, mosquitoes, um, black flies, uh, no see -ems, sand fl fleas, everything out there. So then you really start to get an increase in the low-level jet by about midday. This is at noon down here in southeastern Texas. Look at that southerly low-level jet there dominating. Increasing, too, uh, as the surface low is starting to organize a bit. Uh, this system is ejecting off to the northeast, so there is a little bit of vorticity of action downstream of it, even though the upper-level system is a lot more circular uh, than it was uh, in the previous model runs. But then you can start to see it develop this arc shape to the low-level jet. That's when the severe weather event's probably about to begin. I could even see early afternoon being quite interesting in the Houston area. Even though the low-level winds begin to veer to the south of that surface low, that's going to start to shut down that severe weather potential on the Texas side as that surface low lifts, meanders northeast toward the, the Arklatex. That causes a lot of these low-level winds to become unidirectional as opposed to bending way back out here. And that causes the storm motion to veer a little bit more, a little bit more southwest and northeast here. That jet is ejecting too, which increases the storm motions. Still, though, some pretty meager helicity there after about noon. So I think late morning through noon, maybe the early morning hours, there is some potential uh, there for a tornado threat in the Houston area, Houston, Beaumont. Just seen a lot of these setups and these convective lines come through the area. This uh, location out here, just in the north of Houston, in the heart of the Piney Woods, that's the warm frontal zone, and it looks like there could be a couple of renegade storms uh, near the midday hour, near noon there, to the north of Houston, in the heart of the Piney Woods, closing in on the Sabine River there in western uh, Louisiana. 
Uh, the HRRR is also hinting at some renegades developing here. Uh, these storms are likely going to be uh, developing due to the convergence right along the marshlands, the shoreline there from that accelerating low-level jet and those southerly, southeasterly winds. But really, this area in southeastern Texas, a decent environment, warm front lifts off to the north, uh, winds are nicely backed even to the south of that warm frontal zone in the heart of those deeper dew points. This is a pretty favorable uh, hotograph here for tornadoes and a textbook looking hotograph for the morning of these Dixie Alley severe weather events when sometimes even the lone tornado reports will be out there in southeastern Texas and then downstream in Louisiana. That tornado forecast can bust a little bit. You've got some really backed winds out here around midday. Just to the north of Dallas. This is the uh, 12Z HRRR. This convective line that's forming here too will be broken supercells when it first forms around the Houston area. And then uh, possibly some tornado threat too along uh, the warm frontal zone right on the north side of that instability axis. And then we're going to see this thing march east by 20Z uh, by mid to late afternoon. You do get the hint of some renegades forming down here uh, to the southwest of New Orleans. Uh, out over the open marshlands out there uh, could be some renegade supercells that really do produce a tornado threat but this convective line started to organize over the open gulf of mexico that's where a majority of the instability is located probably going to be some mega water spouts just offshore over the open waters down there decent hodograph shape uh, for water spouts out there better dew points over the open gulf of mexico too dew points near 70 out there and those are largely going to struggle to make it on shore but we're still going to have mid to upper 60s uh, dew points out there in southern louisiana this is at 21z 3 p.m 4 p.m you can see the hint at some renegade storms developing over south central Louisiana, very near the Lafayette area. This is this mode right here is probably the most likely to produce tornadoes if it can materialize. Let's take a look at what the instability looks like here. Uh, the hodographs look beautiful. A little bit of a kink right here with some veer back veer, but that's going to be meaningless with such a big time low level jet. And the low level jet isn't as strong as yesterday's models or some of those forecast models are showing plenty of moisture though uh temperatures warming up into the low 70s here uh, uh as well as those dew points into the upper 60s but the storm relative helicity in the lowest kilometer is only about two to three hundred and that's probably because of these quite meridional storm motions out there well in advance uh, the winds aren't backing quite as much in the lowest kilometer with that uh, more meandering uh, slightly weaker surface low out there but then the convective line marches forward and uh, the nam looks a little bit less or the the h triple r here looks a little bit less favorable for a widespread outbreak and that's because of the shape of the upper system slightly weaker surface low slightly weaker 850 low as well and uh really just kind of marginal zero to one kilometer storm relative velocity of course it increases a little bit as you get closer to that convective line near the sabine river probably some funneling of that low level jet uh, too by the terrain there but really you're looking at about 200 zero to one kilometer storm relative velocity here across the open warm sector these uh, bright red colors to the north that stable air uh, definitely enhanced uh, by the decoupling uh, over that uh, stable air mass uh, acceleration of that low level jet there to the north of the warm front enhancing the zero to one kilometer storm relative helicity, but just not a lot of sur no surface space instability up there uh, north of uh, of I twenty certainly, and really north of central Louisiana. All the instability is located down here, where you do just have a little bit more marginal of that storm relative helicity. It does increase though as you go through the night, as often happens. This is at twenty three z six p.m. You start to see a gradual increase of that storm relative velocity and a bit more out here over southern Mississippi late. This is at about six p.m pretty close to sunset out here near the Mississippi River, if not yeah, very close to sunset. But you start to get an increase in that storm relative helicity well in advance of this arcing line. Still, though, you get about 200 to 250, zero to one kilometer storm relative helicity, even along the advancing convective line. Uh, this mode right here, though, out east of things just a little bit out there into southwestern uh, Mississippi, uh, Natchez area. A lot of times you can get some renegades out in this environment. And if we do pull up a sounding right there, notice how favorable these soundings are uh, with more backed winds, especially in the lowest 500 meters, one kilometer wind uh, near about 40 knots. But it's hardly the 70 knot low level jet uh, that we were anticipating uh, with this setup before. 
But still, this is favorable for significant tornadoes. Maybe not every storm is going to be producing, but definitely is uh, sufficient wind shear for a significant tornado threat. You've got photographs like this throughout southern Louisiana out ahead of this convective line. There's going to be numerous tornado warnings within the convective line as well. Renegades that happen. Uh, the Storm Prediction Center does have, uh, I, I didn't see their latest day one outlook, but I know they had a slight risk or, or the day two outlook. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if this is upgraded to an enhanced uh, risk, maybe even more so. And really, it has this convective line here breaking up and maintaining supercells uh, throughout its duration as it develops kind of more of a meridional configuration to this arc as the surface low meanders northeast toward the arclitex. But you could definitely see the high-resolution NAM resolving supercell storms out here across southwestern Louisiana at about 6 p.m., even making landfall pretty close to the Creole uh, Cameron area out there right along the coastline areas that were so damaged by those uh, multiple hurricane landfalls during the summer. Pretty textbook photograph there uh, for that threat as well down in the Creole area. And a little bit more backing down here as well. Some backed uh, southeasterly surface winds beneath that 50 to 60 knot low-level jet closer to that convective line. And you can see a slightly weaker low-level jet, basically near 50 knots with this convective line, not the 60 to 70 knots uh, that some of the other models were showing. Let's see what the uh, three-kilometer NAM is showing down here. A little stronger of a low-level jet, uh, stronger 850 low out there, slightly stronger surface though, only by a couple of millibars, but you can see the difference that it makes with the subtle change in the shape of the upper-level system, more of an egg shape to this one here, and that accelerates a low-level jet above 60 knots here in Louisiana. And see how this photograph is a bit more elongated with these one and two kilometer winds uh, approaching 60 knots with that photograph. A little bit more backing as well with that slightly stronger surface low of the NAM. So the NAM is uh, showing a bit more favorable severe weather event. And this is the 12Z NAM. But still just meager instability, kind of approaching about 1,000 joules per kilogram. And when you have pretty strong wind shear, then usually this uh, cape could be compensated for. The mesocyclones will produce their own updraft driven by vertical pressure gradients. And they're capable of drilling through these shallow stable layers. Like the NAM a bit more for the regular NAM, for its accuracy here for the instability axis. Over a 1,000 joules per kilogram surface base cape, even extending into the piney woods by 0Z. So the system's a little bit slower, more cut off, not ejecting to the northeast as much. That leads to a slightly weaker surface low. The NAM, though, has a stronger surface low than the HRRR, slightly better wind shear, a stronger low-level jet downstream. Both models, though, definitely show a tornado threat with a guaranteed convective line along southern Louisiana, and eventually this whole threat tomorrow night shifts into southwestern Mississippi. Probably about 10, 11 p.m., with the exception of some renegades. And really, the instability axis dies out by the time this thing reaches Alabama. Probably going to have a uh, weakening convective line with still a little bit of shear out there as that line moves into Alabama. Maybe a couple of possibilities for water spouts and some warnings down there near Mobile and to the western Florida uh, panhandle. But really, this event is shaping up like a southeastern Texas, southern Louisiana into southwestern Mississippi type of an event. See, the NAM still has some isolated convection out here, and there could be just enough wind shear out there to still generate a tornado threat. Let's see some of that shear is hanging on out there. The HRRR even shows a little bit better shear over Alabama on Friday morning than it does in southern Louisiana in the afternoon. But a lot of this is just not going to be co-located with a uh, instability and you can see that when you go over to the energy helicity index but there is an instability axis here central southwestern western alabama and uh, there is a chance for tornadoes even with these photographs out there in alabama as that thing pushes off to the east you can see the critical angles are quite a bit uh, more uh, shallow uh, out there in alabama as this pushes off to the east 
But there is uh, enough wind shear to definitely have that tornado threat extending into uh, western Alabama. Look at this low-level jet actually increase according to the HRRR compared with southern Louisiana. So definitely if there's any instability, any surface-based instability out here, I do think that there is a chance of tornadoes in Alabama on New Year's Day. You can even see some more veered 500 millibar flow in the mid-levels of the atmosphere up there in Alabama. It really capes about 500 to 750 out here across western Alabama. But definitely a non-zero tornado potential. And this includes Tuscaloosa all the way down to the Mobile area Friday morning. And uh, this convective line is slowly going to march to the east. And then there could be another severe weather threat across upstate South Carolina, parts of North Carolina, southeastern Georgia on uh, New Year's Day, Friday afternoon, as this thing pushes off to the east. But really, when the parent Vortmax ejects off toward the Great Lakes region, it is difficult to get big tornado threats. And I could show you this happening here. Look at that Vort lifting off to the northeast. There's going to be a major ice storm with this event as well. Uh, the kicker system coming in behind it. The timing of this kicker system really determined when uh, this system... Uh, evolve from just a, a cutoff closed low down there in northern Mexico to an ejecting system like this closed low. But notice how it's perfectly circular here in the HRRR as opposed to having that classic goose egg shape, uh, in which case you'd have even more, an even stronger low-level jet. But Friday morning, you still got a decent low-level jet here because of the slow northeastward ejection of this system. So I wouldn't be surprised if uh, there are some tornadoes uh, there in, in western Alabama. Look at that. Some might even say it looks a little bit more favorable in Alabama Friday morning than it does Thursday afternoon. And then uh, over here in the southeast, you can start to see that low-level jet uh, begin to ramp up here to the east of the Appalachians. I'll be watching that closely as well. But quite a bit of veered flow. You don't see that monster low-level jet uh, that develops to the east of the Appalachians with this system like we saw with the last one on Christmas Eve. Core of this low-level jet lifts up toward the Ohio River Valley, even the southeastern Great Lakes region. As this vort, more of a compact vort, lifts up toward the southern Great Lakes. So not as much of a stout low-level jet there across the Carolinas. So I would think that the Carolina Alley zone, maybe central South Carolina, a little bit removed from that wedge, has a potential. This is a pretty marginal hodograph right there, but it is sufficient still for a tornado threat. You can see that the critical angles here are surprisingly pretty uh, closer to 90 degrees uh, to the east of the Southern Appalachians and the Carolinas. I might target this event uh, for a chase as well on Friday. So we got a lot of decisions to make coming up here. That's the NAM. Looks like Grand Rapids is going to get hammered by an ice storm by this Friday evening. Oh, look at that ice storm across northern Missouri, northeastern Kansas, southern Iowa dominating, central northern Illinois, north of Indianapolis. Looks like a big icing event. Oh, yeah, look at that textbook. Here's a zero line. See the uh, warm nose there above freezing. Surface temperatures below freezing. Absolute textbook freezing rain sounding right there. This could be more of a sleet sounding with the depth of that sub-freezing layer, a little bit more stout, but this warm nose is substantial. Definitely sufficient to melt those dendrites that form in the mid-levels of the atmosphere from this vertical motion, about 500 millibars. They fall into this warm nose, turn into water droplets, fall into this sub-freezing layer. And that falls in the form of freezing rain accumulating on everything. A look at this ice storm lifting off to the northeast. Just dominating southeastern Iowa there. Wow. Northern Illinois. Starting to move into southern Michigan as well uh, by Friday afternoon. Uh, New Year's Day. Happy New Year's, everybody. 
big time ice storm coming up here to the southern Great Lakes. And this is Friday afternoon, the convective line closing in on the Georgia border. I'm wondering if there's going to be some renegades that develop out here to the east of the southern Appalachians. We'll definitely have to keep an eye on this. But that surface flow doesn't eject as far to the northeast as I thought it was going to. So there's a chance for some decent severe weather Friday afternoon moving into central South Carolina, southeastern Georgia here. Maybe some renegades as well as the apparent surface low is lifting up toward the Chicago area. Big ice storm across southern lower Michigan. Looks like some decent icing as well in Pennsylvania, anchored by a 1031 high out here. So pretty exciting weather for those snow and ice lovers. If you guys don't like snow and ice, I'm sorry. And this is by Friday evening. By about 10 p.m., definitely have that convective line. Still ongoing, southeastern Georgia into central South Carolina. Could be some severe weather. Maybe even a tornado threat down here in northwestern Florida. It's kind of a hot spot this year for these tornado warnings. But that's way on the tail end of the shear. you got very veered out flow down here on the furthest south end. There's always a reason why a storm that's a tail end, Charlie Storm, is a tail end. And that's because... Further south of that tail end, Charlie, the environment simply isn't supportive of uh, additional storms and supercells south of the tail end, Charlie. So it's in an environment that's already pretty marginally conducive for tornadoes. A lot of that's because the wind shear veers out with time on the tail end of these lines. You get a little bit less backing of the low-level winds. Even though there's a bit greater moisture, sometimes the elevated mixed layers are a little bit north of those zones, but you still got to watch these tail end Charlies for mesoscale accidents and tornado potential down here. And look at this high that's just blocking everything, causing this low to lift off to the northeast toward the Great Lakes. And we didn't have as strong of a high out here. It's very possible this system could just barrel into Dixie Alley. Look at that. And it's really this kicker system that forces this to eject toward the southern Great Lakes. Kind of dodging a major tornado outbreak, but I do think we're going to have a regional tornado outbreak down there. Southern uh, Louisiana into southwestern Mississippi. But look at how compact this upper vort is. If this thing were more egg-shaped, more shaped like an ellipse, kind of like a goose egg, then I think you could be getting a lot more vorticity of action downstream of this thing. And it had more of an effective negative tilt to it. But as I said before, these closed lows, the models don't handle them very good. The shape and the timing of the ejection. And that's kind of why we've been changing our target area a lot here uh, over the, the recent days. But still, thank you guys for joining my weather reports. I'm likely to activate chase mode tomorrow. Uh, I'll probably be leaving after my class uh, today with Varsity Tutors. Uh, but there is the final target area for that convective line. Really could probably work the I-10 corridor there in southern Louisiana, eventually going into southwestern Mississippi and then even western Alabama by Friday morning. Mobile up toward Tuscaloosa definitely has some potential for uh, tornadoes out there. And we've got a cold air wedge here to the east of the Appalachians. That's why I've got my, my hat on here, the trusty hat. And I'm really excited uh, about uh, the class coming up here at 1.30 with Varsity Tutors for grades 6 through 12. As we're going to break down the different winter storm types, different precipitation types, break down the different classes of snowstorms. We'll discuss atmospheric rivers, thunder snow, lake effect snow, break down the ingredients for heavy snowfall, and also analyze wintertime tornadoes, which is definitely relevant as we're talking about a wintertime tornado threat in this live. So thank you everybody for tuning in to my weather reports today. Never stop chasing.